Good day, my friend. I have a treat of special for you today. This is Ed with the 2019 ICD 10 PCS code changes. I'm, of course, uh, Ed O'Burn. Uh, you may know me from such hits as the uh, 2018 PCS uh, updates, uh, the 2017 PCS updates, uh, a couple other th things like that, too. But I work for Healthcare Resource Group. You might, too. I'm the director of HIM Revenue Integrity. And I'll have my email address at the end of this presentation. Feel free to hit me up if you have any questions or comments. So I will approach today's uh, presentation on ICD-10 PCS code updates in the following manner. Now this was going to have some highlights and it's going to have some definite lowlights. It's going to be boring in places. Uh, and there's a lot of kind of middling stuff that, and I think that's almost the most important is because it's, you just needs to go in your ear hole once so that if you ever encounter it, you'll have that little light bulb moment. The really obvious ones, um, you know, those will stick out like a sore thumb because it'll be a buzz among the community too, like like knee replacements, for example. It's a lot of action. But the way I'll go through it is in the each slide, I'll have kind of the general nature of the change, like what body system, well, actually the header will be the body system itself. The general nature of the change, like what kind of generally went down, which of the PCS elements or characters changed. Uh, there, most of them are just one, like, add a device, add an approach, um, delete a device, for example. There's a few that have a combo as well. I'll list what the existing codes are that we have or the, or the characters for that element, just to kind of jog your familiarity, like, you know, appendectomy by, you know, you have the percutaneous endoscopic and open, and now maybe there's like a through a natural orifice, like a notes procedure. I get off track. But just so you kind of know the general environment of the PCS codes we're dealing with, and the reason I'm going through body system by body system with all the peaks and valleys instead of starting with the interesting stuff and ending with the boring stuff because uh, number one i'd like for you to stay till the end of the presentation which shouldn't be more than 40 minutes and two is grab your pcs book and flip through uh as you go so you can see the tables where these codes are and you can hit the space bar if you're watching this on youtube or our website uh, and that'll just pause so you can find yourself in the book and then you can follow along with me uh, and then finally for each slide i'll give an example PCS code, what it'll look like in uh, out in the wild when you see it coding. Starting from the top in the noggin, uh, CNS. So we have a new bypass of CSF to a different space. Now there are many of these exist. These are kind of like VP shunts, ventricular peritoneal shunts is just is one example. Um, but here we have the pleural cavity, the peritoneal cavity, the urinary tract, the fallopian tube as existing sites to bypass the ventricular, the CSF2, okay? The traditional one you think about is the peritoneal, but they can go anywhere. What we're doing in 2019 is adding the atrium as a bypass to site. Seems a little weird, it's a different body system, but it actually makes a lot of sense to dump excess CSF back into the circulatory system. And this is for conditions like hydrocephalus, benign intracranial hypertension, um, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, where there's an excessive production of or decreased drainage of the CSF from the brain or the spinal column, which increases pressure and can cause pain and all kinds of neurologic symptoms. For fun, they, we're adding a percutaneous endoscopic approach, whereas currently we only have open and percutaneous. So here's what that uh, the combination of that those two changes would look like to bypass the spinal canal to the atrium uh, with a, sorry, the open approach, I lied that's an existing approach. Now this is a ventriculoperitoneal shunt here from the ventricle directly to that other site. Here it's, they're giving an example of a peritoneal destination for that CSF, but there are certain instances where the spinal canal is drained directly instead of the ventricle itself. So that, that's what the real changes are found in the table that you'll see. All right, only one CSF, only one CNS. Now onto the heart and great vessels. Uh, these get a little bit weird, and if you work in a like sort of a tertiary referral center or children's hospital, you're more likely to see probably some of these ones in the next few slides. Bypassing the, th the thoracic aorta to other upper arteries and the pulmonary arteries, and I think these are going to have very different indications, uh, but they fall on the same sort of PCS table. Um, first thing we'll do is add as a device value zooplastic from an animal or autologous vein or artery graft. That's not surprising especially for an adult. Now, bypassing um, thoracic aorta uh, to the pulmonary arteries is related to the Blalock-Tausig shunt for blue baby, certain blue baby syndromes. And 
I can't give you an exact example of when this particular PCS procedure would be done, but be thinking of uh, hypoxic blue bear baby syndromes where they need to replumb things to take oxygenated blood to deoxygenated blood or otherwise reduce some sort of pressure differential in the heart and great vessels. Uh, now, as for the thoracic aorta to upper arteries, I can presuppose that this is to bypass um, certain obstructions or, uh, or uh, stenoses, which may be congenital or may be acquired. Um, and the bypass two, the seventh character for this family, um, are multiple upper arteries too. Now also, we've gone below the uh, diaphragm, add bypass to the ab an abdominal artery, which is a lower artery too, other side of the um, diaphragm. This may or may not expand. I I can only tell you I have seen one example of a gentleman who had an inoperable triple A that I took care of in the VA when I was a physician assistant, and he had a bypass from his axillary artery here down under his skin, down at his rib cage, and then it turned inward to his abdominal aorta. It was the weirdest thing ever. It was about that big, this huge pulsatile artery on his side. That's what was keeping the lower half of his body around. So that's a bypass uh, thoracic aorta to an abdominal artery. I, I, honestly, I can't remember what it was bypassed from, but it was some big artery up in this area. So here's what that might look like. Uh, bypass the thoracic aorta descending to abdominal artery with, with zooplastic. I just threw that in there for fun. Tissue open approach. So far, always open approach for those big ones. Another upper artery thing, uh, axillary artery to the other artery. So we're dealing with the thoracic aorta before. Now the axillary artery is slightly smaller. And also we can bypass that to the abdominal now. So crossing the threshold, which is between the upper and lower arteries at the uh, diaphragm. We have many other upper arteries to bypass that axillary artery too. And axillary arteries, you could think of it as being a good donor of blood. It can, it serves our arm, but if there's other more important tissue in, in this region, um, it can spare some. Uh, this might be done for a congenital or acquired stenosis or atresia, certain occlusions, congenital or acquired. Uh, it could, m I can imagine, be an emergency vascularization of the lower body uh, from the axillary artery, which is not, it has uh, some surplus blood supply, but not a huge volume of blood supply. So to, to supply the entire lower body, in the example like I described before, from the axillary, a little bit, a little bit unusual, but that may be the possibility. And there's your example code. Okay, and then finally, the upper arteries, I think this is our last one, is uh, no, one more. The carotid arteries to other arteries. Now, we have currently uh, other bypassing a carotid artery to other intracranial or extracranial arteries. So essentially, the carotid arteries serve the cerebral circulation and could be bypassed to other vessels that also serve the cerebral circulation. Now we have the option of adding bypass the carotid arteries to some other upper artery. Um, and I honestly can't think of an example of when that would be done, but one must have been done and needed the code. For example, bypass the right common carotid to uh, some other upper artery that's not a vertebral and not a carotid with an autologous venous tissue. Okay, another upper artery. Sorry for that. Uh, we have a dilation root operation now of the, in the interior mammary artery. Nominate, subclavian, lots of different upper arteries in the in the thorax, mostly in the proximal arms. The difference is we're adding the seventh character for the drug-coated balloon. Now, high emphasis on the balloon, not the stent, because this can be done with or without a stent. Um, it can be coated both ways. So the device character is the stent. The seventh character is the balloon. The coating for actually both of these is a, there's a couple of different uh, elements or, or drugs that can be used. Paclitaxel, which is Taxol, which is traditionally thought of as a, as a um, anti-malignancy uh, chemotherapy drug. Um, there is also Sirolimus, which acts in a slightly different way, but both of those inhibit the proliferation of the intima, like the inner lining of the artery that can cause restenosis. So having the artery be blown out with a balloon. This one happens to have a stent. It doesn't have to have a stent. Um, it tears the intima a little bit. It causes little rips as it dilates the artery out. And the body's natural response is to scar that in. And as you know, like scar tissue tends to sort of, at least slightly, if not greatly, overgrow the bounds of the original wound, so to speak. So that can cause restenosis. 
So these drugs can help reduce that. Now, in the case of an upper arm artery, um, it may not require a stent, but just having that balloon in contact as it splits apart that tissue can help deposit some of the drug right there so that it at least has that effect. Uh, so far, all we had for a dilation of those uh, upper arteries was uh, add a bifurcation or no qualifier in the seventh character qualifier. So we add the one for the drug-coated balloon. Another upper artery. This is the last upper artery. A root operation extirpation of the carotid vertebral arteries. These are cerebral circulation, okay? Internal, external carotid, common, vertebral, and so forth. Uh, pay close attention to the, the way this is described. It is with a, a stent retriever, okay? Now, the first blush, you think it's, it's a device that's used to take out a stent, uh, which is not impossible, but rarely done. Rather, it is a retriever that is stent-shaped. This is a thrombectomy. Extirpation is matter, not a device, always just matter, removal from a body part. So what we're taking out is clot. So that's a thrombectomy, it's not a stent removal. And where the change happens is at the seventh character for the stent retriever technique. Now there are other aspiration techniques where they just suck the clot out. What this one is, is it's a, it's a stent-like device, much like the basket used for gallstones and kidney stones, uh, where it's advanced either aside or right through the thrombus, and then the sheath is retracted away from it so that the stent, this cage-like, apparatus expands to the borders of the, the lumen of the, the artery that's there, and in doing so it sort of squishes the clot from the outside into the stent-like cage, and then the whole thing is withdrawn, usually withdrawn back into the, the bigger part of the carotid here, and then it's aspirated out from there. I would imagine this would be documented pretty explicitly. My caveat for us as coders is simply just don't get confused with the treatment with a stent versus the stent retriever or a thrombectomy. Okay, now final into a different body uh, body system. The lower arteries still dealing with arteries though, so still looking at plumbing situations. We're looking at the leg arteries in particular, this is kind of analogous to the upper artery situation where we've simply added more uh, bypass froms and twos, sort of. Um, what we're adding is bypassing from body part character four, other than the existing one. So the anterior tibial, it's a leg artery, posterior tibial, and, the, and foot artery, generic foot artery. Uh, I could tell you the names, but it's irrelevant because there's no PCS code for those yet. Just foot artery. Now what we have so far is the femoral, that's the big fat leg artery, the popliteal, and the knee and the perineal slightly distal to that. We're just adding other arteries even further distal from that. Also adding an approach of percutaneous. I've never seen that actually done, but the interventional radiologist may want to get in on the action and that's likely the code that they would use. Uh, we have open, which is the kind I've pretty much only ever seen, and percutaneous endoscopic. The reason for doing this procedure may, again, be to due to, sorry for the broken record effect, uh, occlusion or stenosis, congenital or acquired, I think mostly probably acquired, just to revascularize a certain area that's um, not getting blood supply. It could conceivably be done as a shunt for uh, dialysis, Maybe a patient had no arms, or they've had so many shunts in their arms, they need to deal with leg arteries. Uh, bypassing artery to artery or artery to vein is more likely the case. Uh, but in any case, I have uh, combined the percutaneous approach and the new anterior tibial artery and my example code there. Now, now onto veins, we're back up to the top of the body. Dilation of certain larger veins in the upper body uh, with a drug coating balloon, drug coated balloon. Guess what? That's the only difference, really. Seventh character for the drug-coated balloon, and these can be done with or without stents. Vein dilation is more likely to be done without a stent than an arterial dilation. Um, and so far, we've had no existing qualifier in the seventh character position. So drug-coated balloon. What the heck do I have these here for? Um, this is my random factoid to throw at you to just make sure you're still with me and make you glance back at your monitor. Um, the organism that uh, the one of the medications, Sirolimus, for the drug-coated balloons and drug-coated stents, was derived from a species of bacteria, Streptomyces hygroscopicus, found in 1931 on Easter Island, which, is, if you know, is way the heck out in the Pacific Ocean and is famous for the moai, or these heads. So I'm just, I never, ceases to amaze me the weird places they find 
interesting drugs that come across our radar as coders. Anyway, here we have a dilation of the right innominate vein with an interluminal device. That's with a stent in this case, just to illustrate the fact that the, the stent and the drug-coated balloon are separate characters in PCS, separate concepts. So be sure you catch those both. For visceral organ uh, PCS changes, I have only a couple for you, have both in the hepatobiliary system. First is a pretty interesting kind of new technology, uh, irreversible electroporation. This is a technique used for solid organ malignancies in the case of our new 2019 codes, destruction root operation in the liver and the pancreas. Now this works is a couple of specialized electrodes are placed here through the skin. It can be done open in the root operation. I'm sorry, the approach is there for this, but percutaneous is the obviously preferred route place with fluoroscopy, uh, CT and ultrasound or some combination. And both of those electrodes are placed into the solid tumor and they used electric cur uh, current and in the field from it to cause these permanent pores or holes basically in the cancer cells themselves. So it doesn't use thermal energy like heat or radioact or radio ablation energy, so to speak, just an electric field that actually just changes the cell membrane so that it gets porous permanently porous and it basically just dies. It doesn't kill it outright, it just makes it leaky so then it goes on to die. Now there is a reversible electroporation, there's no PCS code for it yet, but it has its own potential therapeutic benefits too of making these cells uh, leakier in ways that maybe, for example, would allow them to absorb chemotherapy better. I'm just thinking a couple of years in advance. So that's why it's not just straight electroporation, it's irreversible electroporation, so that kills directly tumor cells. Um, so we add the seventh character for root operation destruction in the liver and pancreas. And this is also used um, in kidney, the prostate, uh, even vascular lesions I saw some reference to, so soft tissue lesions like muscles and stuff. There's no PCS availability yet, um, but, but expect that as this expands. It seems to be pretty effective. And the benefit is that it's since it's fairly low local energy, it can be really precisely applied just to come just right up to the border of the malignancy and not kill a bunch of adjacent tissue along with it. So pretty cool stuff. There's your example code, destruction of liver. Most of the references I saw were of the liver done percutaneously as you see in the picture there. Um, one more hepatobiliary, and I'll preface this by saying this may require a little bit more clarity through a coding clinic or an upcoming guideline. It's a new root operation, extraction of some solid organs like the liver and the, and the pancreas, but also some tubular organs like the gallbladder and all the biliary and pancreatic ducts all have body part values too. And they're all diagnostic. So it's clearly this is a biopsy we're dealing with here. Let's just pick on the liver as a liver biopsy for purposes of discussion. Um, the, the approaches are all of them, and interestingly, through to through a natural opening endoscopic, so like an ERCP. So I have I have one bit of advice I'm pretty confident about, and one with an asterisk to it. Um, so we're all fairly familiar with the guidelines for biopsies and the options we have, and in indexing it are um, excision, and drainage, and extraction for bone marrow. So far, there's some been some conflicting uh, coding clinics about before the creation of certain root operations for certain body systems, what to do with a brush biopsy. Previously, it was um, treated as an excision, and then when they added extraction for those body systems, um, the brush biopsy becomes coded as an extraction. It's just sort of scraping out the cells. Okay, so that makes sense with relation to the ducts, biliary and pancreatic ducts. So just simply a brush biopsy of the, of the pancreatic uh, hepatobiliary tree through an ERCP. I get that. But what about the liver? The liver extraction leads me to believe that maybe what they intend is, is a core biopsy, which if I had money to put down, I would treat that as an excision, so using a trocar or a cutting needle to t pull out a little core of liver biopsy. It's, it's still an excision, but I, I don't quite know why they added that root operation to a solid organ if... Uh, if it's unless they just did it out of convenience because all the tubular hepatobiliary uh, structures, it, it is relevant, and they just threw the whole category in the hepatobiliary into the body part regions, nonetheless. So, but you can see here through an ERCP, the pancreatic duct, the common bile duct, the cystic duct, the hepatic duct, and so forth. That all makes sense for a brush, but when we get up to the liver, 
or the meat of the pancreas itself. Jury's still out for me. We'll see. Okay, spinal fusions. There's some of my funner stuff. This is actually happens to be a huge chunk of code changes, but for a very boring reason. Um, and I've, come, I've done one for spinal fusions, upper and lower joints. So, so two body systems here. Um, but basically, they took out all the fusions for all the approaches, both of anterior and posterior column, uh, where there was no device. So that's just never done. Fusions are always done with um, autographed or allograft or an inner body device, something like that. So I think this is just um, their way of sort of cleaning up the PCS book so it can be a little shorter in some ways as they expand it in others. So um, you won't be able to accidentally slip into a fusion of uh, any vertebral joint without a device. So basically, you look down the list of hundreds of codes and they all have Z in the device column. So I guess that'll, that'll shrink up the PCS tables of scope. Okay. Not just the spine, but non-spinal fusions, exact same thing, upper and lower joints. I have yet to encounter a case where a fusion was done without some sort of graft or device. So we just strip all those out. I put in a super common one for like a hammer toe, fusion of left toe phalangeal joint, but without graft, who needs it? I just couldn't resist putting in the fusion of the TMJ. What a miserable thing that would be to fuse your jaw joint. I don't know why you'd do that or what that would be like, but anyway. Say goodbye to both of those codes. Okay, now this is where it gets kind of exciting. If you've gotten distracted, this is a time to look back at your screen and pay a little better attention. Articulating spacers. Um, a lot of us will code these things, and they, they've been around a little bit, but there hasn't been really a code for them or how, to, how for us to conceptualize dealing with a spacer, but that has a function. Okay, now we have articulating spacers, root operation replacement, of the knee joint with one of these and then removal of that device because they are always removed. That's the whole intention for both the hip and the much more commonly done is the knee so far. The point of a, a spacer, either articulating or non, is it's antibiotic impregnated so that if a patient has an infected a knee or hip prosthesis, that has to be taken out because that inanimate material, the metal, ceramic, and plastic can harbor bacteria. So it's got to be taken out and wait till the infection dies down. What better way to help fight that infection in addition to IV antibiotics is to put the antibiotics right in the joint space. So traditionally, they just mix some antibiotic into the into some cement and just stuff it in the joint space and then splint the, or cast really the patient's leg in place and let it take action. Well, clever um, adaptation of that cement is just like, let's just mold it into a kind of a joint shape like you see down here the femoral condyle components here and the tibial tray here. And this was one that's been explanted. So you'll see it's slightly damaged. Looks like it has a little crack, a little chip missing there. And that's fine because they wash all this stuff out. They want them to be a little bit porous and granular to let the antibiotic out. Uh, so this is a common bridge therapy between taking out a permanent implant, let it kind of chill out with the antibiotics for about four weeks or so, and then, then put it in a new, fresh, sterile, permanent implant. So we have the replacement of knee, and unless you scratch your head about, well, it's not really replacing it. Well, remember, this thing articulates. That is the, the operative word right there. So the root operation of replace is to take over the function uh, of, I'm just paraphrasing, take over the function of another body part. Well, it's kind of doing that. Not great, not permanently, but it is articulating. So that's a replacement, and then the inevitable removal and then replacement of the knee again with the permanent one. So you have a two for PCS code there. Um, currently, we've got spacer as an artificial substitute, um, but and you may still encounter these non-articulating spacers, so you'll still have that as a, as a device. Um, and here's what it may look like. So a patient had the explant of the old knee, which you, you want to code the infected one, code that too, and then replacement of the left knee joint with articulating spacer, open approach. It's cool stuff. Hopefully none of us ever need this, but it's there if we do. And then we have, uh, this is probably the biggest takeaway code by code for code or number of coders out there who are going to use it is the unicondylar knee replacement or unicompartmental knee replacement too. Now this uh, word has it have been taken off the inpatient only um, list for Medicare, um, but we'll still have some inpatient ones inevitably. And a unicondylar or unicompartmental knee replacement is advantageous for a couple of reasons. One is if only the medial or lateral compartment is diseased um, and, the, and the contralateral 
compartment is fine, why fix it if it ain't broke? Number two is you can preserve the PCL and ACL ligaments by not doing an entire knee replacement, in which case those are cut out. Um, so that preserves some stability of the knee. And so these are great for relatively young and active people, just to replace the part that's arthritic and leave what's left. So, um, we have, of course, the, the option of cemented and uncemented. And we have, there are three compartments, technically the medial, the lateral, and the patellofemoral joint as the, as the one compartment. Now they phrase it um, unit condylar, but both components have to be replaced. The condyle part, that's the femur, and then the tibial part. So it's half a tibia and one femoral condyle instead of two. So here's what that would look like. I picked the removal as the example because that, that root operation is added as well as the hopefully much more commonly used replacement but removal of lateral. So you got the lateral versus medial versus patellofemoral unicondylar, synthetic substitute, blah, 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 open approach. Okay, then here we get towards the tail end here. Thanks for bearing with me. The female reproductive system. Uh, this is something that would never be mistaken for anything else, and that's a uterus transplant. We've currently had an ovary transplant. I personally never coded either of these, but we're adding to this a uterus transplant and the usual suspects of the source graft, allogeneic from a family member, Syngenetic from an identical twin, not even a really closely related family member counts as syngenetic. It's got it's a twin, and that's that. You can look up the PCS um, guideline for that. And zooplastic from an animal, because why not? Um, it just simply adds the body part uterus to the transplant root operation for the female reproductive system. And now these uh, have been in the single digits as far as my research showed number of times done and carried to pregnancy. Oh, this was worked out in the 1966 in dogs. The dog actually had puppies this way and um, humans in the basically the current uh, century and in, in a number of different uh, countries, most notably Sweden. Um, and it can be for congenital absence of the uterus or loss of the uterus due to, for example, peripartum bleeding or infection, something like that. And uh, it must be a really happy occasion. It's, it's a big commitment to go through all this, and it does require currently at least in vitro fertilization to get eggs from e either a donor um, or from the patient's own ovaries, fertilize them uh, outside the body, and then implant them into the uterus. To have the patient's native ovaries match up to the, the transplanted fallopian tubes, if they even transplant the fallopian tubes, I'm not certain, would be, I think, a little bit of a stretch. So they just put in the uterus itself, Put the fertilized egg in, let it implant, and carry to pregnancy, carry to term, hopefully. And this is also meant to be um, temporary. So the patient would have a hysterectomy after they've had however many kids they want that way. And then they could go off anti rejection drugs and just happily live the rest of their life. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to leave it in and then stay committed to being on drugs if you weren't going to do anything with that uterus. So um, that, or think of a resection of uterus following this at some point. The male reproductive system in PCS and for 2019 sees a much more mundane change, and that is a transfer of the prepuce or the foreskin to the urethra or penis. So the change itself in PCS is to add a transfer root operation to the male reproductive system and add foreskin or prepuce to, uh, to that root operation as a body part value. So remember the transfers are from in the fourth and two in the seventh. So you'll find urethra and penis in the seventh characters. And I'll tell you by far the most likely case for this would be urethroplasty, which has its own base code in the uh, urinary system, uh, which is a repair of the urethra. Now that can occasionally be done without any sort of grafts or transfers, but quite likely some tissue is taken from elsewhere and what better source than the foreskin, because it's vascular and it's distensible and it's local, to help to recreate the urethra. Well, here is your additional code for that to account for the transfer of the foreskin flap. So here's an example of the PCS code that you would get. Now, um, one thing I wanted to notice too is we're dealing with different body systems. So if you want to browse your PCS guidelines about multiple procedures, the guidelines, here we have different root operations uh, with different body parts, if different body systems even too. So we've got male reproductive and urinary. I mean, that one is the transfer and one is the repair. That's where I would lend some confidence to you using both of those codes to really capture the essence of that, that type of urethroplasty when done. Onto the anatomical regions. Here's one that 
leaves a couple of questions open too, but I'll do my best to go through it with you too. It's if you turn to uh, zero W one in your PCS tables, you'll see all sorts of cavities that can be bypassed to other cavities or to the skin. The first one is a bypass of the cranial cavity to let's take the peritoneal cavity as the seventh as the destination. So from body part four, cranial cavity. Um, now this is not a VP shunt because it's not bypassing the ventricle in the CNS, but the cranial cavity. So presumably a patient might have a, a subdural hematoma that's just constantly dra draining or something like that. And they've got to drain it to some place inside the body. So they'd run it to the peritoneum. So lest you be confused about VP shunts. But looking at the other tables about pleural cavities, pelvic cavity, peritoneal to various other places. Now there, there's no natural flow of fluid in these spaces anyway. So it, it sort of defies the definition of bypass, altering the route of passage of contents to a tubular body part. They're neither tubular nor they have passage of contents, but just go, we'll go with it for now. What we've done in the PCS codes for 2019 is one is just a really simple, like just adding body part upper vein. There's already a lower vein as a recipient site for the bypass. And we're adding the approach percutaneous. There's percutaneous for some, but not for all. So we're just adding it for more to and from sites. That just opens up things for interventional radiologists. Now I find myself wondering clinically, when, when would this ever be done? And as close as I could find was peritoneal dialysis fistula. Um, so a percutaneous cutaneo peritoneal fistula for peritoneal dialysis. Um, now that has a couple of associated uh, coding clinics, one of which said treat it as a bypass and then a subsequent one to treat it as an, inf an insertion of an infusion device because in fact that's what's done is they dump in a bunch of fluid, let the um, waste products sort of diffuse into the fluid and then drain it back out. So I mean it's, in essence it's also a drainage uh, device as well. But now we've opened up yet more options for bypass of those body parts to one another. So cutaneous would tend to suggest um, that it's a coming out of the body so as a device. So I'm not I'm still not quite sure about that. The example I gave was even weirder than that. The pleural cavity, like if a patient had a chronic pleural effusion to the peritoneal cavity where that fluid could then become resorbed in the peritoneum, something like that with a tube. Uh, that makes a bit more sense because it's taking from one body part and taking to another body part, uh, even if it's a, not a normal flow. But alas, those are our new codes. One more change in the anatomical regions general, and that is to do with gender confirmation surgery or gender reassignment, as it sometimes was called, confirmation surgery, which is just a little housekeeping. That's removing the um, device qualifier for, n for no, no device. Um, so, for example, the creation of a vagina in the male peritoneum, which is why it's a anatomical regions general. The peritoneum is just like that area down there, and the converse penis creation in the female peritoneum. So we've got autologous substitute as our device value, which is almost always what's done. Occasionally, in combination with a synthetic substitute or non-autologous, which I haven't seen, but there's also the no qualifier Z right there. We simply just take that away because it's just never done, just like joint fusions without grafts. Obstetrics, uh, slightly more interesting, but still just housekeeping, changing terminology, extraction, products of conception, that's a cesarean section, pulling the baby out through an incision, always an open approach, and we're just changing the terminology classic to high and low cervical to low. Now, important to note, this is to do with the incision in the uterus, not the incision in the abdomen. The low cervical is kind of a misnomer because the, honestly, the most common is a low cerv or sorry, a low uterine segment right at the sort of the junction of the uterus and the cervix. So it's still technically a uterine incision, but it's made transversely and it's made low. A classic is a high vertical incision in the uterus. Can also be done through a transverse incision, but it's rarely done at all. Uh, so by far and away, most of sections done today are lower, lower uterine section AKA low, so that's easy. Just think of, you see the word low, think low. Um, if, if the physician uses classic, just know that that's high. And here's an example of what you'd see, a classical. Introduction, wait, that slide's supposed to go at the beginning. No, wait, PCS introduction, just kidding. This is uh, probably one of the most common ones, honestly, you would use um, in inpatient coding, and that's just a flu shot. Um, 
We've added in the introduction section a seventh character for the influenza vaccine. Um, the substance value is, um, or the device, so to speak, is serum toxoid or vaccine, so it's that whole classification. But they only added influenza, which I don't know if I'm glad or sad about that. But this is clearly meant to satisfy some inpatient quality measures, which require hospitals to give patients flu shots when they come in and they're not up to date. It's just a big epidemiological thing. So I would advise if your facility um, wants to capture this element, I just raise your hand and ask, you know, do we need to start doing this and look for it? And you can probably just begin to key in that 3E02340 by heart. Um, ECMO, Extracorporeal Assistance and Performance section of PCS, uh, splits ECMO into three types. Currently, we've just had the generic ECMO code, and we get, get rid of that one, and add the three types, central, peripheral veno-arterial, and peripheral veno-venous. So central is from and to uh, central arteries, like from the superior vena cava, or the right atrium, and back into the aorta, so taking out uh, deoxygenated blood, oxygenating it through a membrane, that's what the M is in the ECMO, and then pumping it back into the aorta. What does that sound like? That's cardiopulmonary bypass. That's what they do for heart surgery and that sort of thing. Uh, so less commonly done as an isolated procedure, unless a patient, for example, had a heart, had heart surgery and then went off bypass, uh, but they left the catheters in and transferred, and then they went back on bypass. Uh, that would be an instance to code the PCS code for the ECMO, um, aside from the heart surgery, which happened at the other proceed at the other facility, but the more common would be the peripheral veno arterial, peripheral veno venous. So the veno venous boosts ju um, just oxygenation; it takes out venous blood, adds oxygen, puts it back in the venous system, where it can there be picked up into the right atrium, and and also still go to the lungs and get oxygenated a bit more, and then back into the systemic circulation out to the body. So this does nothing to enhance the cardiac output. It just adds oxygen. So this is for patients with a healthy heart, just bad lungs. The veno arterial um, augments the, the cardiac output as well as the oxygenation too, the more commonly you'll see. So it would remove uh, venous blood from some peripheral uh, vein up to and including the inferior vena cava or even a snaked catheter up into the inferior vena cava and right atrium takes that deoxygenated blood out and then puts it back into some conveniently accessible artery like the femoral artery or the axillary artery, perhaps even the carotid in infants because it's just, it needs to be big enough to find the catheter so babies are tiny that way. So be looking out for that if you code. I, honestly, you'll mostly see this with uh, premature babies, but occasionally with adults too. New technology. For the guys, prostate robotic water jet destruction root operation, XV508A4. So destruction of the prostate using robotic water jet ablation. So it's robotic and it's water jet. High pressure ablation, this joins the numerous modalities that are used. Hard to imagine a uh, urologic surgeon not specifying the water jet part and the robotic part. So it's easy for us to grab. Um, and this will, I mean, almost guarantee you join the normal uh, old technology codes and leave from there. And then finally, new technology, always there's some, some weird drug that comes up that some vendor kicks and screams and gets their PCS code so they can capture that, and that's cool. That's what it's there for. It's expandable. We have introduction of plazomycin antibiotic, and this is for uh, complicated urinary tract infections. The brand name is Zemdri, Z-E-M-D-R-I for the likes of pyelonephritis caused by uh, certain E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, Mirabilis. That doesn't sound like there's anything really new there, but it, it's for, I guess, complicated cases which are hard to treat. It's an aminoglycoside. It's not a macrolide, despite the name pl plazomycin. That just means it's derived from a fungus, like the one I mentioned a few slides back. And so plazomycin is more like genomycin and neomycin in that sense. And then finally we have introduction of the synthetic human angiotensin II into central vein or, or uh, peripheral, which is a uh, angiotensin, you should recall from ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting uh, enzyme inhibitors. Well, angiotensin is a 
a peripheral uh, vasoconstrictor, and this is used for patients in shock or hypotension. ACE inhibitors block conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, this chemical in the lungs. Well, this is um, irrelevant to the case of treating hypertension with ACE inhibitors. This enhances that effect of peripheral uh, constriction to raise a patient's blood pressure if they're in shock. So hopefully that works out well. So once again, it's been Ed. Pleasure working with you today. Uh, happy to hear from you if you have any questions, and I'll see you around probably next year for the same. Take care.